I've had a lot of folks ask, why aren't we seeding clouds in central Texas right now? We need the rain. We've had too many days when we did not have any clouds at all, and the technology of cloud seeding as we know it today does not have the capacity to make clouds in clear blue sky. As a matter of fact, even the fair weather cumulus that sometimes occur on a very warm summer afternoon are not really seedable. The material that we use in seeding works only with towering cumulus the sort of billowy thunderheads that haven't happened very often this year. But I will say in the six areas of Texas where we have been doing cloud seeding, we have had a number of occasions to seed them even in this extremely hot and exceptionally dry summer. This summer? This summer. You, you succeeded in increasing rainfall? Uh, south of San Antonio, we had aircraft flying on a dozen days in the month of July, treating what we deemed to be seedable storms. And what was the result of that? Uh, the same result that we've seen since it started in 1997. Some clouds respond very well. Some clouds respond only to a limited degree. Maybe one or two instances when uh, one or two instances when clouds didn't respond as we had hoped, probably because we got to them too late. And when you say they responded very well, what does that mean? It means that the storm lived longer and produced more rain over a larger area. And how do we know that it did that? I mean, what if you hadn't seeded? I mean, good question. You know. uh, we know that because we systematically analyze on a given day clouds that are seeded and we compare their behavior with cloud, similar clouds in areas adjacent to the target area that were not seeded. And we compare the behavior of the two sets, the treated and the unseeded. And we've been doing that for about 10 years now. And we have seen a very consistent response from storms that were seeded in a timely fashion. You know, for, for us lay people on the ground, you know, we're gonna look up at a summer afternoon in a normal year, or different than this mm -hmm. one anyway, and we're gonna say, oh, look here, there's a big old thunderhead over there. And look at that, there's a big old thunderhead over there. And this one's gonna rain like hell, and that one just spits. You know, so my question is, how do you know, you say it's a similar cloud, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't doubt you. I'm just trying to understand how you can tell. Right. It's true that on a given day you may have two storms visible. One rains a lot and the other doesn't rain much. We're not really sure why one doesn't perform and the other one does. But when you do this sort of systematic seeding in one area and compare it with what happens in adjacent areas, when you do that long enough, and you get the sample size big enough, then you can draw some statistical significance to the numbers that you see from seeded storms versus the behavior of the unseeded. Okay, all right. And, and, and t talk to me for just a minute about what seeding is. What, what, mm -hmm. what do you guys do up there? Seeding involves the release of a material that includes silver iodide whose crystalline structure is almost identical to natural ice. In a typical cumulus cloud in the summertime in Texas, there are a limited number of uh, natural ice crystals in a growing storm. And seeding is designed to increase the number of nuclei. These are, these are tiny specks around which cloud water coalesces to form a raindrop. When you introduce silver iodide crystals into a thunderstorm, a young thunderstorm, that may only live 20 or 25 minutes and produce maybe a quarter of an inch, if you introduce those ice crystals early enough in the life of that cloud, more of the cloud water will be converted into tiny snowflakes, which will then attract more cloud water to form raindrops. Uh, seeding is designed to nudge the cloud along, giving it the ammunition it needs to make more use of the cloud water that's there. 
All right, and and what it does that is, is there is there a way to get a handle on how much more rain and ten percent more, fifteen percent, thirty percent than it would otherwise deliver? Yes, our research done in the 1980s, which sort of laid the foundation for the state assisting groundwater districts in building these projects in the mid-1990s during the last major drought. Our research indicated that a seeded storm on average would produce 2.3 times the amount of rain that a neighboring unseeded storm would produce. So more than double? More than double. And the results of the analysis that we've done on cloud seeding in Texas since 2002 has corroborated that. And so when you extend that over, say, a growing season from April to October, you're looking at a 20 to 30 percent increase in seasonal rainfall for an area of, say, 5 million acres. That's a substantial amount of additional water. We're looking at a couple of hundred thousand acre feet of water per project uh, from single cell storms only. And of course, we seed multi cell storms as well. They're, they're more sophisticated, they're more complicated to analyze. And so we're only using the numbers from the single cell storms, but even those numbers are very encouraging. And, and how much does it cost uh, r relative to what we get out of it? Is this, this is a cost-effective science that we're doing here? It is. It costs less than a nickel per acre. When we built the project starting in 1997, we estimated it would cost about eight cents per acre. And each one of these target areas, uh, cloud seeding project areas, covers about five million acres, essentially the reach of a Doppler radar system and to work clouds that develop within that five million acre area uh, you need about two to three aircraft. So the initial startup cost is more because you have capital assets like aircraft and radar to purchase. But once you get those paid for then you can operate at probably four cents an acre. And who's doing this? Who's, who's, who's doing it and who's paying for it? The groundwater conservation districts in West and South Texas Many of the counties in Texas now have these districts. They, they regulate the amount of pumpage uh, in areas where there are major and minor aquifers. And so there's a the water beneath the surface. They're paying for it through their tax revenue? Yes. They have ad valorem taxing authority, which means they can distribute the cost of their program uniformly over their county or their, uh, their district. And, and who makes the decision, okay, we're dry enough, we need to do this. I mean, you wouldn't do it in an extremely wet year where we're facing floods, right. for example. So who, who says, okay, mm -hmm. we need to do it? Today. The decision is made by the elected boards of these groundwater conservation districts. And do they own the airplanes or do they lease them? Or? They do. We here at TDLR help these districts build their programs. We matched money raised at the local level with state money. And once they got their programs in place, their aircraft and radar paid for, then they assume the maintenance cost of their projects.